So we will move on to the third speaker of the day, Dr. Eric Zuru. His presentation is titled The Role of the State in Safeguarding Intangible Cultural Heritage in the COVID-19 Era. Professor Zeruto yes. is the director of CCCPET at Santo Tomas University, Philippines, and the professor of the Graduate School for Cultural Heritage. Currently working at NCCA Cultural Education Program as a cultural heritage consultant. And he's also uh, serving as the uh, Filipino executive member, executive member of the UNESCO World Heritage Convention and the Philippines delegate for 2003 UNESCO Convention. With that, I'd like to introduce to you, Professor Eric Zerudo. Thank you very much. I'd like to greet everybody, all our onlineers. Uh, pleasant day. I would like to thank the organizers of this 2020 World Forum for Intangible Cultural Heritage. And also, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, the contribution of my colleagues, Ms. Beverly uh, Bautista and Father Jonas in the preparation of this presentation. From the Philippines, I'd like to share with you this uh, presentation entitled Pulso, the Philippine Intangible Cultural Heritage in Times of COVID-19 Pandemic. Resonating COP21, nature can exist without man, but man cannot exist without nature. Natural heritage is the source of cultural heritage that all meanings and narratives that relate the two dimensions are human construct called intangible cultural heritage. Recalling the excerpt from the 2003 Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention, whereby intangible cultural heritage is the community's response to their environment, their interaction with nature and their history. ICH is about the people's values, particularly people's harmonious relations with nature. It is the source of psychosocial stability for the community to survive, supernatural ruptures. In the Philippines, when our body is not in balance, heaters, doctors take our pulse, or we call this pulso. Community living traditions dictated the resurgence of indigenous healthcare practices to spare local peoples from pandemic, even under the directives of our Philippine government. This ice age narrative was evident during the cholera pandemic in 1820s, the Spanish flu pandemic in the 1920s, resonating until now in this COVID-19 pandemic of 2020. In the 1820s, the cholera pandemic swept the Philippines during the Spanish period, which was the scourge that evolved legislations based on health and sanitation. Gleaned from the correspondence of Pashano Rizal, the brother of our national hero, Dr. Jose Rizal, this was narrated by our historian, Ambert Ocampo, to where cholera's situation plagued the Philippines in the 19th century. Once cholera spread from the busy port of Manila to nearby provinces, the house where the carrier stayed was immediately burned. In the beginning, the officials were hiding the incident so that they would not declare the port dirty and consequently disrupt the bullish export trade. The rapid spread moved the governor to order blankets and medicines from Hong Kong to be distributed to the provinces. He inspected the public markets in Manila to check on spoiled fruits, meat, and fish needed to be thrown away. Food that would cause a disease, such as dried fish and shrimp paste, were all forbidden. The people went to early morning masses, Catholic masses that went on in processions every night. Novenas, prayers for some rock, patron saint of the sick were cited incessantly and priests were everywhere to bring spiritual aid. The officials scrambled afterwards to fix quarantine procedures in Philippine ports. Spanish legislations were required to ensure health and sanitation. Specifically, the Cartilla Higienica y Desinfectación con las Precauciones que deben tomarse en el caso de una invasión polarica. This was issued by the Provincial Commission and Council of Sanitation in Madrid in 1884, specifically for the Philippine colony. The historian Francis Gialogo extensively studied the 1920 Spanish flu pandemic in the Philippines. His introductory discussion highlighted the American colonial officials' lack of seriousness that led to misinformation on public health and miscalculation of our public health statistics. The source of the disease was attributed to the longshoremen and other laborers along the waterfronts of the Manila port. This indicated the foreign origin of the disease, 
from other parts of the world. So according to the statistics, the Spanish influenza pegged 70,000 to 90,000 deaths with 6.8 to 9.2 deaths per thousands of population. Marine and land quarantine were imposed. There were many activities that were conducted during the lockdowns, such as prevention of communicable disease lectures, distribution of medicine and anti-influenza bulletins, sanitary orders for cleaning, even the construction of this type of uh, sanitation system, the Antipolo style, in the middle of the booming Manila cityscape. There were even sanitary provisions to clean up uh, candy bars and ice cream shops, even the poisoning of stray dogs. Folk practices and herbal medicine emerged, and even the cooking of a very popular rice porridge with ginger and chicken was recommended. Behind these measures, problems were encountered in combating the, ep the epidemic. Problems retaining the health personnel due to resignation. There was the blame game that ensued in the ranks of the colonial officials. There was no contingent plan to highlight many of this congestion in the leper colonies, even in the prisons. In the end, this Manual for Management Communicable Disease was published in 1919, which provided basic information and protocols on influenza. Totally caught unaware in the first quarter of 2020, the whole world panicked with fear and uncertainty with a new coronavirus that emerged from Wuhan, China. To survive, people just called for a healthy ecosystem, holistic well-being, and food security. On March 15, our president, President Rodrigo Duterte, declared a two-month lockdown on the whole Philippines. The government provided guidelines for local government officials to follow under the supervision of the Department of Health. He also signed into law the Bayanihan to Heal as One Act, Republic Act 11469, which granted him special powers to address the outbreak in the whole country. The National Commission for Culture and the Arts, the highest cultural policy making of the country, supported the program to extend financial help to displaced cultural workers. The assistance program for cultural workers under the state calamity provided a cash assistance of $1.54 million dedicated to almost 15,000 freelance artists. To grasp the magnitude of the COVID-19 impact to the cultural sector, the commission launched the online survey on the impact of COVID-19 on culture and the arts and through its Philippine Cultural Education Program, initiated Dunung Katutubo Program regarding the documentation of local community indigenous practices on cultural resilience and survival. While the whole country was under lockdown, the Catholic Church was immobilized and was isolated. But nonetheless, the churches developed practices to communicate the devotion of powerful images to the people. Do now, this is a tradition where in the appearance of religious images were shown through windows, doors, even rooftops, provided, which provided spiritual comfort to the community. Let me walk you through three indigenous people's practices that were observed, that emerged during the height of the national lockdown. This is Te Eren Tingao, the significance of compulsory rest day of the Bontox in the mountain province. The mountain province is in the region of the famous Ifugaurai Ceresis, our world heritage site. It is one of the provinces composing the Cordillera region, which includes Benguet, Ifugao, Kalinga, Apayao, and Abra. Cordillera traditional leaders put very high priority to public welfare, emphasizing social contact and decisions and actions in local governance. According to Governor Bonifacio Lacuasan, as indigenous peoples, we listen to the bearers of indigenous wisdom. It has kept our people safe and strong since time immemorial. On the March 30th, with a rampage for food relief, Mayor Gabion Gangangan of Sadanga declared in his FB account that his local government will not get any relief food pack from the national agency. Instead, he requested that this be given to more needy areas in the country. Compulsory village confinement is invoked in the whole province of the mountains. It could be called the air, Tengao, Sede, Pare, Kabaya, or Tungao. In nearby Ifugao province, it's called Tungo or Tungao, while in the Kalinga province, it's called Ngilin. The air has many contexts. It happens before and after a chuno. Chuno is a, an elaborate feast of merit among 
the elite in Bontoc Mountain Province. The air gives farmers also time to decide on work allocations around house of members to avail of resources and enforce physical rest from heavy labor. The air is also resorted to during critical environment constraints, particularly spread of sickness and pestilence. It also serves as a means to gather the focus attention of the community on critical issues that affect the general welfare. With the Luzon lockdown at the height of COVID-19 pandemic, the mountain province resorted to their living tradition in the institution of the Te'er and Tingao. In one area in the mountain province, Te'er is conducted with the offering of a chicken with salted meat called Changte. After the ritual, elders put plant cuttings or tikken. These are guava-like uh, cuttings. Some put uh, carabao skulls in front of their houses or they just bundle grass tied loosely. This signifies no entry or no movement in and around the village. In Sagada town, the elders performed March 21, the Chang, the uh, Sede in the capital of Bontok, the very revered elder Changar Fakat performed the Manang Te, which involved divining omens from the internal organs of the chicken. Fires were kept burning all throughout for several days as a protective charm against the virus. The next ritual is also from a near, near, nearby region, this is called Ananud, Anud, Abang, and Gakkit. This is the river ritual of the Cagayan Valley indigenous community. The Cagayan Valley region is the domicile of the Itawit, Ibanag, Yogad, Gadang indigenous peoples. The region is composed of provinces of Nueva Vizcaya, Isabela, Cagayan, traversed by the El Rio Grande de Cagayan. The four indigenous communities share similar heritage related to Anud, or in English, swept by the river. As narrated, the tradition was performed as August 16 in Amulung, where the main idea was to make a floating vessel full of offerings to be swept along the river to stem the COVID-19. There are various intents toward a pestilence, sickness, or bad luck they call Amul, to prepare for a festival to prevent a sequence of negative events, to appease the deities of the river, so as not to get the children while they are playing in these rivers. Preparation involved local town officials who sponsored the construction of the bamboo boat and even private ones for the decoration. Carpenters had to take, uh, had to clean up themselves to do the 14, 13, 12 layered combination of young bamboo rafts. Then the construction of a uh, motif uh, made of uh, nature inspired embellishments. You know, inside this raft, offerings were laid ceremoniously. There was sticky rice, chick, arecanut, tobacco, wine. On extreme cases, a pig's head with red band and earrings were required. From the house of the head, the Surkano, four young men with spiritual commitment carry the boat on their shoulders. They all go to a procession where people put inserted clothing of the sick children insert clothing from themselves or drop coins on the boat. Along the riverbank, a ceremony of dancing, singing, and music ensued while the boat laid on ground. So, after which the boat flowed along the current while the Sorcano called the deities in a dalugai. He summoned the deities to accept all the gift offerings, keep the community from sickness, and spare the children from death. So the last practice is we call Panubad Tupad, this is a chicken ritual of the Ata tribe of Davao City. Davao Island has the highest concentration of indigenous communities in the whole country. It is a city that's shared by 11 tribes. For indigenous peoples, it's called the Obu Manuvu, Atigsalog, Bago Plata, Bagobo, Tagabawa, and the Ata tribes. Muslim communities included Iranun, Magindanawan, Pausog, Sama, Maranao, and Kagan. So the city government developed this uh, Kadayawan village, an eco museum for all these indigenous communities to converge. This is where they practice their community traditions and customs. After the strict lockdown of the whole country, the Ata tribe requested to conduct Panubat Tupad, a ceremony to sward off this sickness. Led by the tribal leader, Dato Lumayong Bayuntong, he began with a white chicken, which signified a form of thanksgiving and also to give them guidance and ways in their activities toward the future. He had to kill a chicken, had the drop 
he had the blood uh, drip in the four corners of the house and he looked at for uh, all the signals, particularly when the chicken collapsed. Where the head pointed to the east, this was auspicious events over the future, while to the west, prudence had to be taken for the imminent problems. When the head pointed to the north south, each member of the community had to be responsible for most of their actions. ICH is a meaning making activity of man to make sense of nature, environment, society, and history. ICHs are interaction based on the heartbeat of nature and the universe. According to our Filipino anthropologist, F. Landa Hocano, life is conceived by people in harmony with nature. The pulse is its ex expression. Anything which tends to interfere with this flow of harmony upsets the pulse beat. Imbalance of nature is the plague of man. So man must feel this pulse of the earth. With that, thank you very much. And I greet everyone a pleasant afternoon.